You're still muted. Okay, now it looks like we can. Can see me now? And, and hear you too. Can you hear me now? Good morning. <laughs> yeah. God is good. You haven't yeah. received it, Bishop? No, sir. Oh, okay. Can we just take two minutes to worship God on our own, please? Yeah. Just worship God. If he hasn't done anything good, worth thanking him for. Thank, thank him for me. He's done a lot for me. <laughs> I know he has done a lot for each one of us. We have a lot to thank him for. Thank him. Let him hear your voice sincerely, appreciating him this morning, for he is good. He is super good. He is faithful and wonderful and marvelous. He is the only faithful God. The only faithful God that we have. Let's praise him. Let's praise him. Let's praise him. He's wonderful. You are beautiful, Father. You are wonderful. You're mighty God. The only God in your class by yourself. You are faithful, God. Compassionate. There is none like you anywhere. He's faithful, faithful. He's faithful, faithful. You are faithful, God. You are beautiful, you are faithful, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. He is wonderful, you are faithful. Thank you, Father. You are dependable, reliable, consistently consistent, unchanging, unwavering, constant, derives from you. Beauty derives from you. You are wisdom personified. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, when you praise God, even before you see the results of what you're looking for, that is also an expression of faith. When you have prayed and there is nothing more to, to pray, the next, the only, the only thing left is to praise him like somebody who has lost his mind. Mm and watch him respond to you. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Like, like Pastor Merton just mentioned, we're going to be interacting. From last week, we looked at the character of God, and uh, the character of God is not a topic that can be exhausted. 
So we keep chipping at it and God might take us to different areas depending on who is speaking at whatever time as the Lord leads. But this is a topic that I believe uh, we all need to spend the rest of our lives studying and developing. All right, so uh, we, today we're going to kind of look at the part B or part two of it. And hopefully the Lord will minister to us. Um, when we say God is beautiful, has anybody seen him before? Anybody? Am I muted? No. When we say God is beautiful, has anybody seen him before to know, to, to be able to describe his beauty? Not really. Well, when we say God is beautiful, what we, are, what we see in our mind's eye is his character as displayed or expressed. If you read the book of Revelation and you see the description of Jesus, my head can't, uh, is beyond me. I can't imagine somebody with a sword protruding, protruding from his mouth and his feet like burnished brass and his hair like wool. You know, in our world that we live in, that is not the description of beauty or handsomeness. Am I right? But he's from a different world. And beauty there, beauty that we know here is the shadow of what beauty over there is. So we're going to continue to, uh, I want to encourage us to continue to, you know, focus on this, getting to know who he is. Uh, today we'll be looking at um, part two, we'll be looking at Ephesians chapter one. From this uh, Ephesians chapter one, verse five. So, uh, and we'll be asking questions. These are not questions for us to, uh, it's not a question to, for somebody, it's more of a question that we can contribute to, but we are not looking for the correct answer. Because the correct answer will be cultivated, the desire is that we cultivate the correct answers in ourselves. We develop those correct answers in ourselves. This is the, the desire. So, what does it say? It says, as dear children, I'm reading it by heart, as dear children, be imitators of God. Am I right? Be you imitators of God as dear children. Paulette, nice to see you. Welcome. Yes. Say, as dear children, be imitators of God. Am I right? Is that what it says? Yes. Okay. So, Bishop, did you ask us to unmute so we can interact or? Okay, you are muted so we couldn't hear you. But I think, let me just lay, take a minute to introduce this and then we can go into the. You say, as dear children, be imitators of God. When I was growing up, you know, well, I'm still growing up. When I was much younger, in my walk with, in, the, in the faith, I came to Christ newly, we consider it humility when we say, oh no, I'm nowhere near Jesus, I'm nowhere like him. We look at it as, we, it's, we, it sounded humble. But if you look at the scriptures, I'm sure Jesus would be disappointed hearing us say that. Because what the word said and what I and some of our, my buddies were saying at the time, the mindset we had, and unfortunately, so many of us still have today, is very different. You know, the word says one thing, the world says another thing. The word of God says one thing, the word, the world that we live in says another thing. So we, in order to fit in, and fitting into what? Fitting into people's expectation, most times 
we, we refuse or we miss the opportunity to reflect who we really are. But the sad thing is if you tell that person who doesn't want you to tell exactly what you look like or who you are, if you tell that person the person is ugly, the person is not going to be happy with you. You see what I'm saying? If I ask you, are you like Jesus? And you said, hey, Trish, nice to see you. If, you say, if I say, are you like Jesus? The hum humility in quote, we say, oh, no, I'm not like him. I'm nowhere near him yet. But if I say, okay, if you're not like Jesus, then you're very ugly. You're not going to be happy with me. Am I right? Oh, if you're not like Jesus, then you must be like the devil. Maybe somebody will pick stones and run after me. Thank God I'm far away, so nobody from the U.S. can stone me. And there is no movement over here, so I'm safe for today. But what I'm saying, in essence, is that what we consider to be humility is religious uh, falsehood, is religion. The Bible says, as dear children, talking to me and you, to you and I, or you and me, it says, be imitators. In other words, be like your father. Do like your father. I learned to wear ties from my father. My father loved to wear tie. He would wear tie to the farm. He wear mm -hmm. tie everywhere. He said, I learned to wear tie like my father. And my father would talk straight. He doesn't, if it's true, it's true, it's true. He's going to tell you to your face and you will, you know, uh, maybe I learned to be like, I need to, I need to change some things, you know. But you see, and then coupled with the, uh, the, the prophetic anointing, you cannot afford to color God's word for him. I can't do that. So there are so many traits that we took from our parents and our children are taking traits from us so that it is the pride of, our, of parents, our, our parents that we grow to look like them. So God is saying here, uh, the word of God is saying here, be imitators. Somebody said, okay, if I'm to imitate Christ, what way do I imitate him? And this is the number one question. What does that mean to you as an individual? What does it mean for you to be an imitator of Christ? The every, quest, every answer you are presenting, please remember that you are setting a judgment for yourself. God knows you know. So that if you don't develop that character, uh, <laughs> you don't want to get dinged. But I'm also not saying this to say that we shouldn't feel free to talk. We are all growing. I'm growing. What I learned last week, I, I hopefully have made this positive change, tweak something for better, for the better this week. And this coming week, I'm looking forward to improving. So this is where we are. If we say, if the scripture says we, are imit we should be imitators of God, what does that mean to you? Now, Bishop, maybe I can you can give us that scripture. And you, you told us to run Ephesians 1 verse 5. 5 verse 1. Is it 5 verse 1? Okay. Say thank you. Thank you very much. Ephesians 5 verse 1, not 1 verse 5. Yes. Ephesians 5 verse 1. Sorry about that. Okay, you see where I need to improve? <laughs> okay, yeah. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1. As dear children, be imitators of God. And depending on the translation you are using, it's going to be different. So uh, it's a scripture that when I read it, I, I try to hide sometimes, especially when I know that I'm not reflecting him the way I'm supposed to be. But it doesn't get it out of my heart because it's there. So it's either I line up with it, you know, so what does it mean to you to be an imitator of, of God? What area are you as an individual working on imitating him? And as we'll a couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, 
or it may have been left. We were to write down three traits of God that are most important to us. And then the challenge was for us to, to state how are we making those three traits um, our um, character? How are we molding them into our character? Right. Thank you, Bishop. So what does it mean to, imitate, uh, to be an imitator of God? And the floor is wide open. Remember, we're going to be, we're going to be interactive today. And I'm not going to call on anyone at all. We'll be, we'll be free. What does it mean to imitate God? Who wants to? And as Pastor Jerry said, there's no wrong answers. No. Martha is going to say something. I'll go first. I remember my three. I don't have my notes. But I remember the first thing I wrote was that God is kind and God is generous and God is patient because I that's the way I always see him interacting with me the most, I think. And I think in terms of kindness, I struggle a little bit. Well, I don't struggle being kind with people I like, but with people who have hurt me, I struggle with being kind to them. And I think I have a generous heart. He is always, since I was a child, I think he just kind of made me generous. And the more I knew Jesus, the easier that was for me. <clears throat> but the third one, patience, I think that's the area I probably struggle the most with, is to be patient <laughs> with other people. And again, especially people I don't like or that have been mean to me or mean to someone I love. And so I don't know if we all kind of fall in that same pattern. It's just kind of curious if the third one we yeah. read, one we struggle with. I don't know. But that's kind of what I remember focusing on this week. I'm right there with you, my dear sister. There are some people, if not for God, sometimes I wish there's I left to me a turn off the sun for them. <laughs> Turn it up. <laughs> let him stay in the dark that's right let him stay in the dark for two days you know yeah. but yeah. thank god i i am not god so i understand you any other yes sir yes, yes. Just have to talk. who's speaking who's speaking all right. We, what, 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 what was the question? The question was, is, how what, do you what, imitate God? No, what, yeah, what does it mean to imitate God? Oh. Yeah. Um, what, to you. I think Moira was about to say something. Oh. Well, this is what I've been learning. Because I interact with all kinds of people, even, even working remotely, and I have a very large family, siblings and children and grandchildren and and a lot of neighbors. And what I have learned is that kindness is, I don't want to say the glue that holds us together. I'd rather say it's the oil that keeps the machinery working. And I have found in my relationships with people, my neighbors, and the, my attorneys who are not in any way close to Jesus, that I have to accept them. I have to see the good in them and I have to accept them for who they are. And once I accept them for who they are, the kindness is able to come out of my heart towards them. And this is something I've had a lot of contact with a lot of people recently, especially I went up to Chicago and, you know, up there I deal with just a lot of people who help us with Angel and with the children. I mean, it just seems like June and July were months of contact. And this is what I really found was that in order to fully be kind to people, you just have to accept them where they are. And Last night, we went to babysit for my daughter and my son-in-law, and two 
more different people. I just, it's hard for me to even believe that she is my daughter because she is so different from me in so many ways. And constantly the Lord was reminding me, kindness comes from acceptance, Myra. It comes from acceptance, simply accepting for who they are. I made them. And this is something that I'm resolved to work on and hope that from my kindness, perhaps I can reach into their heart a little and really talk about Jesus. But it starts with kindness, which breeds acceptance. And then everything flows from there. This is what I'm learning. Uh, isn't that just like the heart of God? You know, some people, uh, you, you wonder how could God love these ISIS characters after mm -hmm. for the atrocities they do? How could God love them? But he loves them just as much as he loves you and me. Mm -hmm. so, that's, um, so that's imitating God right there, uh, Moira. Mm -hmm. Loving even when it's hard to love, mm -hmm. even when they're different, even when they're difficult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any, anybody else has something to add? Remember the um, remember. Yeah, right along with the um, I think most people have already touched on love, but you know you tr you aspire to love unconditionally like him, which is a hard thing to do. And um, be of service to your neighbors, mm -hmm. you know, to some extent. Yes. The way he does. Mm -hmm. or, the, or the way he does mm -hmm. and another tough one is to be to have the tolerance of whoever it is that comes into your path mm -hmm. it's going to be difficult at times where you try to be as tolerant you know as, as god is to all of us regardless who we are and you know our makeup our characters our beliefs you know just some of those are some of the three points i think it's good to strive to, to get those attributes uh-huh and, and, and that's why you talk about tolerance. That's uh, part of the, of the spirit <laughs> of joy, peace. You have it in you, but we, we all have them in us. It's just to develop them. And the more we develop those nine component parts, fruit of the spirit, <laughs> love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, kindness, uh, whatever, um, self-control. I know it's nine. The Goodness, more faith. Goodness and faith were in there. Right. Oh. Uh, you know, and love, faithfulness. <laughs> love, suffering, gentleness, kindness, faith, meekness, temperance, or self-control. And uh, yeah. the more we develop those, the, 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 the more we are, we find ourselves imitating God. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, where I, one of the areas that I struggle with, um, and that I need to to imitate uh, God in um, is loving where I feel I'm being taken advantage of. When I feel that my kindness is, is, um, is I, I don't want to say not appreciated, I want to say taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. um, that's an area where that I struggle with. And um, by the grace of God, uh, through prayer and with every situation, um, he gives me victory. But I constantly find myself having to uh, dig into, into prayer and scripture for the strength to continue being kind and to allow to be taken advantage of, of what I perceive as being taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I I hear you perfectly, uh, Irene. Uh, you know, so it's um, sometimes yes, we do suffer that that indignity of people um, mistaking our kindness for weakness, and because they perceive us as weak, then because we are kind, then they they take advantage. But we love them still, and we be kind to them nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Any, any other? And then anyone? Okay, Trish is about to speak to us. One of mine was, uh, we have a very forgiving God. 
that seems to be a thing that I've been struggling with over the last few months, as some of you know. Uh, forgiveness. It's, uh, it's a big thing, and it's in every day of every minute of our lives. And uh, just like she was just saying, you know, she, people take our kindness for granted. But then at the end of the day, that feeling that it gives us, we need to forgive them for the way they're treating us because we've been kind. We've been doing everything that God wants us to do. But again, it falls back onto that forgiveness and forgiving category where they don't know, but we need to show them. So uh, at the end of the day, uh, forgiveness is a big one for me which I'm working on and I'm getting there as we all are. Mm -hmm. um, and all the other ones we're loving. Trustworthy. God is very trustworthy. If mm -hmm. anything, if there's anyone to trust, it's definitely him. Yeah. No one else. No, no. Unfortunately, no brother, no sister, but it's him. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the number one. But uh, forgiveness, I would have to say. He's a very forgiving God. And that is my number one there. Love to be like that. Okay. Thanks for sharing that, Trish. Uh, I'm glad you touched on forgiveness because that's a big, that's a biggie. And uh, why should we, why should we forgive? Well, first, when we forgive, we're obeying a direct command from God that we should forgive. Okay. And, uh, we, when we don't forgive, when we harbor resentment, uh, bitterness, it, it, it has a way to, 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 to to work against us adversely. Even our physical bodies are affected when we harbor uh, resentment. <laughs> and uh, so, so that is, and, and it's, not, it's not by accident that Jesus told us to forgive. He knows what can happen inside of our own bodies when we harbor bitterness, you know? But it mean, also means obeying him. If you love me, keep my commandments. So when we forgive, we are obey, We are being more like Jesus. We are, we, are, we are being loving in an area where it's hard to love. And we are obeying him. And, and that's, that's a wonderful thing to do. And I would like to echo what Trish just talked about. Being able to, uh, to, to, to forgive somebody. I struggled with that for years. I never thought I was capable of forgiving someone who have done you wrong, who have pretty much almost destroyed my life. I was broken. I was in despair. I was afraid and I was angry. And that's just the few of the components that have made unforgiveness for me a hard thing to conquer. But God, Amen. Amen. but God, it was inconceivable for me to forgive one particular person in my life. But when you go before the throne of God and ask for his mercy, ask for his grace, ask him for his help through his Holy Spirit to help you defy the odds of what will almost destroy me, Years ago, I can tell you that if I can do it, we all can do it. We all can do it. And God, I'm telling you, he worked, he, he was just peeling me bit by bit, breaking me down skin by skin, and got me to the point where there was nothing else I can do but to forgive this person before he died. And he knew it. And I give God thanks and praise for what he has done through me. Time out. And you couldn't do it on your own. No, absolutely not, Alice. No, 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 no. And if we say we can do that, we're making lies of ourselves, aren't we? 
can do it on your own. It can only be done when we talk about deep hurt, deep pain. It can only be done through the help of the Holy Spirit, Amen. the Holy Ghost that lives in us. That's the only time you can do it. So you can we can conquer it. Yes. We can conquer it. Can I did. It on your own. I did. Can't happen. Okay. And, and I want. It to becomes ask. freedom in freedom. Sorry, more. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll ask later. Freedom. I was about to say, and it gives you freedom from freedom. Mm. There are levels to freedom, you know. Yeah. And I'm not talking about the shallow one. Yes. The deep one. The deep one, Alice. Yes, you want the to deep say one that where you feel you're drowning, and I'm a good swimmer, so. <laughs> yes, Anne. I agree. With Anne, Anne, Anne I, I would like to ask you something. Were you able to forgive this person before you actually saw them, or did you forgive them when you saw them? No, no, no. It had nothing to do with seeing them face to face. Nothing. It all, it had to be done in the privacy of my own of a home, Amen. between myself and God. There you go. Mm -hmm. My goodness. Yeah. So when it came time to even hear the voice of that individual, or even see, well, seeing was not, seeing was not an option. Just hearing the voice made all the difference. Yes. Because by that time, I was really prepared to go to the next level wow. of just solidifying it right there and then. Okay. I think it's the favorite trick. I, I, you, we're coming back to you. I just want to do something because this is so rich and I don't want us to rush it. So can I read out the question? So, if we don't finish them today, uh, yes. we can have something to meditate on during the week and come back again to them. Would that be okay? Would yeah. that be good? Yeah. Okay. Amen. All right. So please hold your thought, Martha. We're coming back to you. The second question is, what does it, John chapter 20, verse 20 to 22. That's where the second question comes from. So if you're writing, please. John 20, verse 20 to 22. So the question for that is, what does this mean to you as an individual? Okay. Now, number three. John chapter 4, <laughs> verse 34. It says, what was Jesus' greatest desire? Okay, uh, number four, right? Four. Yeah. Why was the father so pleased with Jesus? John chapter eight, verse 29. All right, number five. What makes Jesus' name carry so much weight? What he was written richly through him. And that is Isaiah 42, verse one. And Philippians 2, verse 1 to 11. All right. Then the last Pastor, but Pastor not Derek, the list. Yes, sir. Jeff, you're, you're going too fast. All right. Okay. Um, come, come slowly. Start from, start from question three and go slowly. Say again. Verse what? Number what? Go, go to the third question. Uh, okay. The, the third so question. John 4, 34. Okay. The, the, que the third question is, what was Jesus' greatest desire? What was his greatest desire? Is John chapter three, uh, chapter four, verse thirty-four. And and number four is why was the father, or why is the father, so pleased with Jesus? And that is in John chapter eight, verse twenty-nine. And then, can I go to number five now? Are we okay? All right, number five. What makes Jesus' name carry so much weight? 
And that is Philippians 2, verse 1 to 11, and Isaiah 42, verse 1. Philippians 2, 11. And then the last but not the least, which is number 6, is what trait or traits are you cultivating for yourself currently? That has no verse. <laughs> That has okay. the whole Bible. It has the whole Bible. Okay. If, if you need me to repeat, please always. Uh, we, we used to have somebody who can write fast, write them out for us. Maybe maybe not today. Okay. No, but, but I, will if, them, I will repeat them as we, as we go through. Oh, so. Okay, good. So back to Martha, please. Go ahead. You were about to say something before I interrupted. What I was going to tell Kurt, before Trish talked even, that the key to kindness to someone who has hurt you is forgiveness. And so I agree completely with what Trish said and what Ann said, and I believe someone else chimed in, maybe Irene. Irene. Um, that, that's so true. And I think it's a favorite trick of the enemy to pull a Christian into his camp and to separate <laughs> us from the Lord or his, you can't separate us entirely, but it can throw you for a loop and knock you down because the truth is, God wants us to forgive, and part of that is because, well, first of all, he commanded it, but it's also, like you said, Jerry, it's part of his nature and who he is, and we are his beloved children, and we are to be like he is, and that's a part of holiness, and what I found with uh, unforgiveness, especially the more you love the person or the deeper that person hurt you, the harder it is to forgive, but... Mm -hmm do what Ann said and you face God and say, I want, I love you more than I dislike this person or what they did to me. I want right. to be obedient. I'm giving this to you. I can't do it by myself. And right. you just simply turn in obedience and hand it to the Lord. The Holy Spirit will free you up from it and help your heart to let it go. Right. And as you let it go, God, the Holy Spirit starts healing your heart. And you are able to think of that person and even the offenses that happen, no matter how deep, and you're able to face it and look to God and you're healed. And it's just so, so important. It's so important to be in line with him and to not let him use that trick to pull you. It's a favorite trick, I do believe, for all of you. know, We all encounter it. Yeah, I want to add one more thing that's, that you just triggered, Martha. And um, it wasn't one of the three that I wrote um, last week. But if you go back to the Garden of Eden and you go through all the scriptures, God's let it go. And what do I mean by God has let it go? God cannot control your and my will. And so for me, one of the things that God has been working on me is letting go. And so just as you were speaking, Sister Martha, it hit me that you know, truly that's part of God's nature because God cannot control what I do. He cannot control what any one of us does. But yet for us as humans, we think for us to control the variables we have to actually control and hold on. So thank you for reminding me that God's nature is letting go because he cannot control our will. As much as his heart pains when he sees us disobedient, he wants me to let go. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I totally agree with that. So in other words, the more, if I heard your conclusion well, Martha, the more we love the Lord, the easier it, let me rephrase that. We can only show kindness to the degree to which we love the Lord. Did I hear you well? Yes, that's yeah. okay. okay. Being obedient to him. Okay. Because then he, he's more present. And <coughs> Kindness, light shining through us, we're his children. Good. 
Praise God. Any other person? This is so good so far. You know, they, they, um, as, we, as we obey him, as we get to be more like him, and that's a great thing. There's no greater thing in the world than to be more like God. But there's an added bonus. When we live in obedience to God, we have freedom from, from, from sickness and disease. We can look, we, we have authority over all of those things. And um, the, the more submitted we are to, to God's will, the more obedient we are to him, the, um, the more authority we can exercise against the, um, the attacks of the enemy. And, and, and so many Christians, so many uh, uh, born again believers have issues in their lives that should not be there. And we know that, um, that um, uh, sin opens the door for all kinds of things. Disobedience to God, unforgiveness is sin. Fear is sin. So many sins that open doors and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, block our prayers, hinder our prayers, hinder uh, our, uh, our authority as, as, um, as believers. So this is just, just awesome stuff. And thanks for all who have shared so far. The, 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 the question, the second question was, uh, what does it me mean to you as an individual? The third question, what was Jesus's greatest desire? And that was John 4, uh, verse 34. Question four was, why was the Father so pleased with Jesus? We have two more questions, but we won't go there just yet. Um, so what, uh, what does it mean to you as an individual? Did we finish question one yet? No, what does it mean to imitate God? Are we still on it? I think we finished. I think we're okay. Finished. All yeah. right. So John, yeah. John 20, 20, 20 to 22 is the, yeah. Yes, 20 to 22. Yes. The attachment is, is a scripture to question two. Yes, it says, yes. Question two was, what does it mean to you as an individual? Mm -hmm. and, and the scripture to that, would, if someone wants to read John 20 verses, 20 to 22. Um, I have the King James Version here. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were they, the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you. As my father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, receive you the Holy Spirit. So that's the scripture and the question, what does this mean? What does this scripture mean to you as an individual? The, the emphasis, emphasis for, the quest, uh, for, the, for discussion will be 21. 21 yes. As the Father has sent me, so... I'm sending you. Yes. What does that What does that mean to us as an, as individuals? In other words, go out and be disciples. Hallelujah. Go out and be disciples. Spread the word. Save, save life. Yes. For the kingdom, that is. Yes. When I look at Jesus, um, he has many attributes, of course, but the thing that stands out about Jesus is that he spoke the truth. He lived the truth, he breathed the truth, he spoke the truth, he didn't hold back the truth. And so that is definitely, <clears throat> you know, God sent Jesus to speak the truth. As my father has sent me, even so I sent you, God sent Jesus <clears throat> to speak the truth. It's one of the things that Jesus did. And even so send I you. 
And what I have found is that the truth, it's like a sandwich. If you just tell a person the truth, not only will they not receive it, but it can create a wedge between you. But if you sandwich it between love and praise and acceptance and letting that person know that they are truly valuable to God, and then you slip the truth in, it's much easier for them to accept it. And that is something that I've been learning recently and that I've actually been learning ever since I got saved, the sandwich technique of Jesus did send us to give people the truth. And without us, some people are never going to hear truth. But how we say the truth is very, very, very important. Yeah. As you said that, Martha, uh, um, Moira, it, uh, I'm reminded of something I read from John Maxwell, uh, that um, uh, speaker, that uh, um, motivational speaker. He said, said seeing that you're doing well, and uh, we know that God is faithful. His blessings, his promises, his word concerning. Okay. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Good word. <laughs> Apologize. He's faithful. Good, good, word, good word. Good word. Good timing. Yes. The, uh, John Maxwell said, um, "Love without love without truth is hypocrisy. Mm. Truth without love is brutality." <laughs> so you. Um, so the, the sandwich method that you you talked about just now you resonated with me. Mm -hmm. Who else wants to jump in? Uh, when I think I love what you said too, more, and it does take me back, Merton, what you said to the verse that says, we are to speak the truth with love. And that is hard. It's hard to, it's easy to speak the truth with truth, with just truth, like you said, being brutal, <laughs> brutally honest. But it's really hard to speak the truth with love where you're considering the other person, even if it's hard or ugly. But what I wanted to say, too, is when I think of Jesus and him being on the earth, uh, one picture that really always comes to my mind is him, how he was always getting alone from the crowds and being pulled by this world to be with his father, that his constant focus, even when he was with the people, was walking with the spirit of his father in him. He always had his eyes and his heart set on his father above even to to the point that he could consider going to the cross and he counted it joy and the reason he counted it joy was because he was pleasing his father and i just think wow that's what i think of when i think of jesus that precious heart mm -hmm. that incredible love for his father. he constantly allowed him to pour into him as well if that's what it is mm. That, that next part in John 20, where he says, if you forgive someone their sins, they're forgiven. If you don't forgive their sins, they're not mm -hmm. forgiven. Getting back to where Trish was, that's not an either or. You don't get to decide, well, I'm going to forgive you. I'm not going to forgive you. That's an admin. You have to forgive everybody for their sins. Otherwise, they're not forgiven. It's, it's a heavy responsibility that you have to forgive and forgive and forgive. Otherwise, mm -hmm someone's sins are not forgiven and that's a terrible burden to bear mm. yes yes I like i like how you just said you have to forget you have to forgive mm -hmm. but you also you have to forget mm -hmm. what he did to you in order to forgive properly that's my struggle i'm working yeah. on it i'll get there yeah. mm -hmm. yes. but i think even though you forgive yeah, you know it's difficult to forget but as long as you don't dwell on remembering mm -hmm. and that allow it to take you back to that place, because mm -hmm. it's, it's sometimes difficult to erase something from your, from your memory. Yeah. You know, but as long as you ask for forgiveness and forgive that person, I think, as the Bible says, that person is forgiven. But see, I think it goes back to what Ann said. It's where you've, take, you've been taken captive by Satan when you get in that, that noose around your neck of that harm and you're not willing to forgive. But when you forgive with the power of the Holy Spirit, his spirit sets us free. Mm -hmm. And yet we can still remember it, but it doesn't hold us down to that right, exactly. negative emotion. We're free. Yeah. 
And what, what I'll add to that as well is that I tend to think when you forgive, really forgive, it helps you forget. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, I agree. What does I it do mean? agree with that. Yeah, what does it mean to forget? Let's, let's, let's look at that. Oh, what to forget? What does it mean to forget? But in this case, I'm sure the Lord does not expect us to suddenly develop amnesia. Mm -hmm. right. Like Martha said, the emotional baggage that came with it is, is yeah, gone. It's gone. Yeah, right. of course. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so you will remember, but the thing is, when you think of that person, when someone mentions that person, or when that person comes into your thought, there are no negatives no. that come with right. it. Right, yes. And you can say you have forgotten. Right, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. That's what I meant. That's what I meant to say, Pastor Merton. That's exactly what I meant to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, it's good. You know each other so well that you can. I know. It's words. like I, I, I think she says. I think <laughs> I think it. She says it. She thinks I say it. That's, that's, that's how good. We are. That's good. How many years have you two known each other now? Uh, um, over, oh, thir long. over thirty. Too long. <laughs> Bar a, a little bit too long. <laughs> <laughs> Over 30 years. I've known her since she was a little baby. <laughs> <laughs> He's right about that. <laughs> Praise God. So, do we... Bishop? Yes, do, sir. Oh, okay. Do we, we round up here for today, but we will continue as the Lord leads, but we can... Uh, we begin to just want, we want to be respectful of time. If possible, meditate on this during the week and let's see what the Lord will give to you to pass across to us when next we meet. Uh, I like the 21, verse 21 of John 20. Let me just touch it a little bit. What does it mean to us individually? To me, the fact that Little me is remembered by him to say, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. To me, it means, it conveys to me a huge amount of trust, faith, belief in me. We believe in God but sometimes we forget that he believes in us too. Yes. So that he says, as the father has sent me, the, the thing that came to my mind was, has always been, anytime I read it, how did the father send him? The father could vouch for him. The father trusted him. The father knew he was going to succeed. Remember in the book of John, he says he's been tried. He said, tried and precious stone before he set for us as the, as the foundation of our faith. So he's saying to me too, I've, I've, I, I want to vouch for you. I believe in you. I know you will do well. So you go ahead and be what I'm supposed to be. Do what I'm supposed to do. The, I, I use the term be first because being, our being, our becoming, is more important to God than our doing. It is our becoming that actually empowers our doing. Yes. It is who we are, that God, God is more interested in who we are than what we do. So mm -hmm. when I discovered that several years ago, I resigned from professional pastoring. I want to be a disciple. I want to be a son so that I'm not doing a job anymore. I am loving my father through my service. So uh, that is what comes to me. As the father has sent me, so I'm sending you this week, even starting from this moment, is a reminder that if there's a situation, you just ask yourself, if Jesus was here, what would he do? And then, you go ahead and do it immediately. Jesus was upset with people. So getting upset with somebody is not a sin. But 
he was wiser than letting the uh, anger hold him till dawn, till the sunset. Uh, he, because if he couldn't forgive instantly, he was self, it would be, he was defeating himself. He came because he has already forgiven us. So he was upset. So you can be upset with something that is wrong, uh, but let it go. Like Pastor James and, uh, uh, and my sister Martha said, let it go. You I know? have a question. Can I? No, Sorry yeah, to interrupt. Yeah. I just have a question. I always I have wonder um, if it's godly to withdraw from people that are constantly in strife or murmuring or cursing, because sometimes I wonder if God is always there for us. So then I should just remain there, or is or it's okay to, you know what? I love you, but at the same time you create me like kryptonite right you make me weak <laughs> so i i don't know if i always struggle with that if it's okay to withdraw from people that are always creating problems or gossiping or or we should just remain there and listen um i don't know if someone can kind of help me with this please mm. this is often it's true to be by himself and to be away from people and nor did he just stay he didn't stay with the same people always and he would often withdraw from people to be alone and to be with god you can't just keep yourself surrounded with with people who are going to harm you mm -hmm. okay thank you yeah there are some companies that are toxic <laughs> and you, you 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 don't want to be there if you have to be there though if you absolutely have to be there then my message that I spoke uh, two weeks ago, we talked about that set of Christians who are who insulate. Uh -huh. So that's where where that would come in. But God does not expect you to stay there because you're a, a Christian. If you're not making a, 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 an impact on them, um, uh -huh. uh, but they're dragging you down, there's some, and especially sometimes they are believers themselves. But yes, uh, they are. Yeah. Unbelieving believers, they can. Uh, um, the Bible says, "From such turn away." <laughs> All right. <laughs> yes. 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 Okay. Yes. This is mostly in, in the workplace, and yeah. mm -hmm. you know, you, you live by keep seek peace and pursue it. Be kind to one another, and but still, it's just. Uh, yes. Can um, yeah. fire them too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. What do you say? Can I fire them? You say? Oh, no, you didn't hear it. From I, I'm me. not the owner of the business. <laughs> yes, thank you. you know, thank you very much. Ali, <laughs> Ali, in my law firm, I run into this. And um, I have been there for 14 years. And people just know that around me, you don't gossip. And you don't talk like that. And it's nothing that I've ever said, but I just have raised a standard. Like if somebody says something really negative, generally these people who um, curse and swear and they, they gossip. Mm -hmm. And so what I do when they, I don't get them for cursing and swearing, but when they gossip, I remember there were a few times in the past where I said, you know, my feeling about this is if Jesus loved this person enough to die for them, then I can't in good conscience speak nasty about them. Uh -huh. And all I had to do was say that a few times and people really knew you do not gossip around her. And so they just shut up. If they're all gossiping and I come along, they shut up. And so perhaps that's what you could do is just kind of raise the standard where they just know that that's unacceptable to you and you you can do it in love but you can raise that standard yeah Creative. because usually i would just uh, say you know what i i don't know i I'm, I'm not allowed who i am to judge people and i don't want to partake of that but they will still tick, 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 tick. and i'm like <laughs> why are you <laughs> talking too much like sometimes i just 
go and say, no, you know what, I'll just go somewhere else. I'm yeah, it's difficult when they're right next to you and you don't have your own office. Mm -hmm. Every situation is different. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't move away. It's very difficult. But well, over time, awareness will be created by your, your re response, reaction. Respond, to the yes. So it takes yeah. a little time sometimes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you. Allie, um, I've been a hairdresser for 25 years, and in the workplace of a hairstylist, it's definitely very gossipy, very political, and it's very hard to separate the two. But the best thing I can say to you is take that negative conversation and turn it to something positive. Oh. And eventually, you do that a few times, they'll stop. But it's a very yes. difficult thing to do, especially yes. with what I do. So yes. <laughs> just try your best. That's all you can do. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You, just, you just took words out of my mouth now, Trish. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. OK. Yeah, so Pastor, before, before you wrap it up, Pastor, and, and it'll take us into communion, um, do you want to just uh, re repeat those questions um, from say, yeah. question two? Yeah, please repeat them for me. Okay, I can do yes, that. Yes, sir. Question two, uh, and this is what we're going to go home with, uh, as if we're not home already. <laughs> <laughs> what does this mean to you as an individual? John 20, verses 20 to 22. Question three, what was Jesus' greatest desire? And the scripture for that is John 4, verse 34. Question 4, why was the Father so pleased with Jesus? And the scripture, John 8, verse 29. And this question, the longest question of the, of the batch, number 5, what makes Jesus' name carry so much weight? What makes Jesus' name carry so much weight? And the scriptures are Isaiah 42, verse 1, Philippians. and Philippians 2, verses 1 to 11. And then the last question, last but not least, question number six, what trait or traits are you cultivating for yourself? Pastor Jerry, um, I'm over to you as we move for communion. Praise the Lord. Thank you, sir. So please, another thing.